What's good everybody? I hope you're doing well. Today the visibility is really bad and it is super foggy out today. I don't know if we're going to get too much of anything, but we're going to try to get some black and white photos. Um, maybe, hopefully some geese will pass. If I could just come away with one photo, it'll be a miracle today. But I wanted to kind of go over also just some tips uh, that I think are outdated uh, that pros like to use that I think we should try to avoid. So check out this uh, beaver hut or a otter den. I'm not too sure what it is. I think it's an otter's den. But it is super cool and it has a really cool backdrop with the fog here. It is super neat and I think it's going to be a, make out for a really cool black and white photo. So let's just get a quick shot of this and get it in the bucket. So the very first pro tip to avoid that I think could be outdated is this idea that you have to shoot uh, the rule of thirds. Now, if you're not familiar with the rule of thirds are, it's just, you know, imaginary two lines vertical, two lines horizontal uh, in the composition in the frame, and like a tic-tac-toe. You want to put your subject, uh, your animal, your wildlife, whatever your subject you're shooting, uh, in the center of one of those uh, dissecting lines, right, where they dissect or intersect. That way, it's not, your subject is not right smack dab in the middle of the frame. However, that's important, but I think that it shouldn't be a requirement on every photograph. Try to avoid having to feel the pressure of always needing to keep the rules. Rules were meant to be broken, in my opinion. The next one is really has to do with cropping, about how, uh, in wildlife photography anyways, it's, uh, you know, we do a lot of cropping and uh, heavily cropping. I think it's outdated that you don't have to always crop. You don't always have to get that, you know, that portrait uh, f photo of the wildlife allow more of the environment to be included in the frame including in the picture avoid always having to feel like you need to crop every single photo of your wildlife my next tip that pros like to throw out to that i think you should avoid this one's gonna get a lot of heat is try to avoid sometimes not always but try to avoid shooting in raw whole cliche that you must must you always have to shoot in raw to get the better or the better the better photograph in the end the idea of needing to always always shoot raw i think has its place because it, yes raw compared to jpeg raw files hold more data and you can experiment more with post processing <laughs> you can hear hear the geese Shooting JPEG a lot of the times allows the camera itself uh, to do a lot of the processing for you. So all I'm saying is just experiment a little bit. Now I know the pros out there are going to be screaming about that. JPEG, no, no, shoot raw, always raw, raw or nothing. Sometimes it's good to go against the grain. If you're somebody who likes to heavily edit, like me, <laughs> raw definitely has its benefits i think in the photography community we get so hung up on that kind of stuff uh that you know we discourage uh sometimes other photographers uh when we find out they're shooting in jpeg We're like oh don't do that don't do it just switch over real quick you know slow down know your role it'll be okay jpeg will be okay in fact you can probably stay out a lot longer shooting jpeg because you can shoot a lot more photos on your memory card. Oh, foggy out here. Look at this. I can't even see anything. That's okay. We'll still get some pretty cool black and white shots. Uh, kind of some eerie, uh, moody, moody, moody shots. So the next pro tip that I think is outdated and that you should try to avoid, I think, would be this whole idea that you cannot have a busy background, that busy backgrounds make for horrible photos. Now, granted, that's true <laughs> in a lot of situations. However, sometimes having a cluttered background, having a lot of foliage in your composition can be a benefit and work towards your advantage because sometimes you can frame just right having your subject being partially blocked by uh, some branches, by some foliage, by a, uh, a bush, 
uh, flowers. Yeah. It can still tell a really, really good story. Now, generally, you want to try to avoid that. I get it. You want a clean, crisp, you know, background where the, the, the subject will pop out. I totally get that. Uh, that makes for a great composition. But I think it's kind of outdated to be always uh, tunnel visioned on that. Don't be afraid to work with and have the cluttered background or a busy background um, work for you instead of against you is all I'm saying. Because there is a story to tell in every photograph, in every composition, in every situation. And if somebody does not like your photograph, that's a good thing. Because you're supposed to be different. You're supposed to be unique and supposed to shoot different. Instead of always looking like a cookie cutter, every you know everything looks the same. Every photographer's photo looks the same. Every photographer's editing style is the same. If somebody doesn't like your photograph, that means, in my opinion, you're making progress. You're learning. You're growing as a photographer. There's a, a hunter out there. I can hear him firing off. I don't know how you'd see see the waterfowl right now, man. As a hunter, that'd be crazy. But. These trees are looking mighty sick right now. Check it out. I'm definitely going to get out there and get a few shots here in a minute. It looks pretty eerie. It looks really cool. Which brings me on to my next pro tip that I think is outdated and that should be avoided is this whole idea that you need to shoot the golden hour and sunset, sunrise, backlit, all, all of these uh, good tips, good things that I think um, have their place. However, I think it is vital that you and I and we as photographers don't hold that as truth because like right now, it is a fabulous time to get out and do nature photography. Uh, when the weather is uh, raining, when it's foggy, when it's misty, uh, when it's thunderstorming out, overcast, when it's the total opposite of what a lot of professionals will tell you to do, where you want that nice golden light coming down on the uh, wildlife to have the colors pop and uh, give that warm color to it. And that's great, that's, that's, that's true. That's true. <laughs> However, don't take it as tr only truth. Uh, learn to break the rule of only going out during those times. A lot of good opportunities in all different types of weather, in all different types of situations, at all different types of days. So break that rule. Jeez, and I can barely even see because of the fog even with the, the binoculars. But this brings me on to my next tip that I think um, is outdated. And that is that you need expensive gear. Um, a lot of the times you see the pros with the huge, heavy, white 500, 600 F4s, primes, um, that are the price of a vehicle, a used car. I think we all, if, if money was no option and we had all the money in the world, I'd be buying a lot of those lenses too. I'm not gonna lie. I think we all would as photographers. However, however, the whole idea that you need expensive glass, that you need expensive equipment uh, to get out here and enjoy nature and do wildlife photography, uh, I think is outdated. You don't. You can get some amazing photographs with a beginner's kit. In fact, it's really hard to tell the difference uh, on social media with what people are shooting with. Cameras today, even the beginner models, take phenomenal photographs and uh, they keep pushing the barrier with technology that pretty much virtually any camera out there today is, is phenomenal. And I just think that if you're not printing your work and you're not trying to find the differences in them, especially if you're just using social media uh, for your portfolio, which come on, most of us, that's what we are, are social media photographers. I would never know the difference what you shoot with, whether it's a $10,000 rig or a $2,000 rig. In my personal opinion, it's more about the lighting, it's more about the composition, and the type of editing that you choose to create that makes you stand out as a photographer. Which brings me on to my next tip to avoid that I think is outdated, and that is it has to be tack sharp. Everything's got to be tack sharp. I think just trying to stand out and be different is more important than 
having everything corner to corner, center to corner, the entire picture being tack sharp. I think that's a phrase that is just thrown around too much today in photography, having to be tack sharp. Try to experiment, do different things, find your unique editing style, get the creative juices flowing, bring the artist that is inside of you out, and just be unique. Stand out instead of trying to fit in, if that makes any sense. It doesn't have to be tack sharp. It doesn't have to look perfect, whatever that looks like. Be encouraged to step out of the norm. Be a little different. Be a little different. It's good. If people don't like your photo and they want to pick apart everything, oh, it's not sharp, or it's overexposed, or it's this or that, or it looks computational, look, if people are nitpicking over your photos, that's a good thing, like I said, because you're standing out, you're being different. Create your own vision of what you want. That's how you're gonna find joy in nature and wildlife photography. Let's step out here real quick and see if we can get a couple of these cool black and white shots. And then we'll come back in and go over the last couple tips to avoid that I think are outdated by pros. Let's go. POV style. Gotta get these trees. Oh man, my Jeep looks sick right now in the fall. Gotta get a couple shots down here. I think that down here will look cool. Look at these rocks looking up. I'll throw these pictures up real quick. I hope you guys like them. can't see a thing, honestly. The visibility is pretty, pretty bad. It's pretty sweet looking though. So check out this uh, lantern set that I purchased not long ago. These things are super cool. I got this big one here. Check that out, <laughs> that's so cool, isn't it? And then uh, these little, two small little ones. They have this uh, rustic look and that golden glow to them. <laughs> I think they're pretty cool and uh, unique and it'll be really cool for these trips uh, out of the marshes where it starts to get dark. I wanna get some hot coffee going or all my day camping adventures and stuff like that. I like them, super cool. I'll leave a link down in the description below if you guys are interested in picking some of these up. So the next one is that you need to have camo. For the vast majority of wildlife, I think that you can get away with just wearing to like, you know, bland, dark greens, browns. These types of colors uh, aren't really going to give away your position uh, as much as the movement will. How you approach the wildlife and how close you approach the wildlife in the manner that you approach the wildlife is going to really dictate the type of photograph and if you're gonna get a photograph at all. It's not necessarily the camouflage. Small birds and waterfowl especially, I think camouflage has a much more advantage. However, I do think that the slower the wildlife gets and the bigger the wildlife gets, the less of an impact I think wearing camo head to toe is really going to affect you getting the shot or not because i shoot some bald eagles and i'll tell you what i do not think one second that those eagles don't see me even in camo because they do and the bigger the wildlife like bear elk moose camouflage in those situations probably aren't really going to help you at all but definitely small small songbirds and waterfowl especially it's more about how you approach the wildlife and there's a lot of truth to that especially in uh, public places uh, where the wildlife is kind of used to being around people at local parks, state parks, Those types of environments where wildlife is kind of used to being around people. You, you, ha you don't really need camouflage as much um, to wear out in the back country, hiking, you know, three, four, five miles out into the back country, out into the wilderness um, or out into the marshes, wherever you, you know, may be at. 
where the wildlife is not used to people, camouflage could have its benefits there. And my last one, which is kind of ironic because of my current situation. Uh, and that one is that you don't need to come away with a photograph. They're out there, I promise. You can't see them, but they're out there. It's a good thing. And it's a humbling experience to just be able to put the camera down. I'm not gonna lie, I have been disappointed in not getting a photograph or getting blurry photographs for that matter, which is a lot. But I've never been disappointed about being out here, about just coming out here and experiencing nature for what it is and making the most out of the opportunity of being out here in nature, away from all the chaos of life. It's just good to be out here and be able to say, you know what, I got skunked but that's okay. Getting skunked isn't really necessarily the worst thing possible in the world. Well, getting skunked by an actual skunk, that would suck. But the, the, what I'm saying is getting skunked out here and not getting a photograph is not the end of the world, but I, I know you guys knew that. Truly, truly nothing better than being out here. Even on a foggy day where you can't see nothing, <laughs> being out here does for our mind, for our body, for our soul. That is what this is all about. That is what nature and wildlife photography is truly about. We put so much pressure on ourselves to get the photograph. Even though I do preach that you can always come away with something, which is true. You can always come away with something, but sometimes it's okay if you don't too. So remember there is no such thing as a bad photograph, only a missed opportunity. I'll see you guys on the next one. Cheers.